now as we speak, please. We were at the Mexican food restaurant last night, and not that I like it or nothing, but we was there having a, a meal. It was too hot to eat yesterday. And uh, we were, they were talking about this dish that Sam Maggerty introduced my wife. Um, we went and rode Thursday night with uh, Twisted Riders, had a great time. Um, and Sam introduced her to this bowl of sausage. And so I didn't think nothing about it. And we got over here, and yes, last night she wanted that same bowl of sausage. And they call it something. It's got sausage, a little bit of dirt, and some cheese, and just some neat stuff in it. So the waiter was standing there, and I asked him about this sausage. And of course, we had Joel and a few of them there, and, and, and they, they really they can't believe the pastor would ask a question. But I, no question is a dumb question, right? So I'm there, and I'm like, okay, I got some questions about this sausage. Now, how do you tell Mexican sausage from American sausage? Because I just don't see the difference. And he's like, well, the Mexican sausage has all these additives like peppers and all this stuff. It has maybe just a little bit of brown sugar and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, I can, I can understand that. I mean, Americans have hot sausage, which is very good. And they have mild sausage. And they have sausage sausage. So, my next question, y'all might know. Well, how do you tell a Mexican pig from an American pig? Because in Oklahoma, we have pigs of all kinds. We even have those ones that we like to go shoot at because they're just like rodents. They're just pain in the tech. But I, I really thought that I was going to get a... A question, and, and, and he looked at me kind of dumb, like, what kind of idiot do you take me for? I mean, because I was just asking, how do you tell American sausage or pigs from Mexican pigs? I mean, do you call them across the border, or, or do you, I don't, I don't know, I just want you to tell me. So as we were sitting there, we were trying to figure out uh, how you could tell a Mexican pig from an American pig, and the only way that me and Kevin and a few others could find out how you tell Mexican pig slash sausage from American pig slash sausage was the Mexican pig says oinksy and the American pig says oink. I don't, I don't know if you... That was a true question. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm still not real. No. I mean, can I say that from stage? I'm not telling anybody on Facebook to shut up. This uh, Brent, thank you. We don't like to call people out, but Brent, why not? You're on Facebook, you know. You mean, I shouldn't probably tell you, Mom, Dad, whatever. Anyways, this morning, y'all may, y'all are going to have to bear with me because I got a lot of stuff going through my head and I got about 55 minutes and 23, 22 seconds. So I'm going to try real hard to get this all mapped out, but I I want to talk this morning uh, about how we are supposed to be different than the world. And I know that there's probably all kinds of answers here today, but I want to talk about it, about what we were raised up like in my life and, and, and what, what I believe that, that God was saying uh, um, when Peter was talking about it in 1 Peter, but we're going to talk this morning about living in it, but not caught up in. Living in it, but not caught up in. This morning we live in the world, but we're not supposed to get caught up in the world. And there's a, there's a fine line there, and it's very hard to navigate that in life. Because we were taught growing up, or I was, that, that if you... I was raised up Pentecostal, and the ladies wore short skirts, and the men wore ties and suits. And yes, I do have some pictures way back when I was a little youngster being in that. And that's how we were different than the world. We didn't go do certain things in the world. We um, refrained from being around certain things in the world. And now 
the way I was raised is totally different than the way I act today because I'm going to be in the world as deep as I can get, but I'm not going to do everything that they do. And I think that some of us have this idea that if we are living holy, we have no parameters to go by. We just, because everybody in Connersville knows that the church, they know everything that the church is against, but they don't know what the church is for. They don't, they know everything that the church will not permit and I'm using that church word lightly, but they don't know what it's for. Because today I have more fun than I ever did growing up and that I ever have in my life, and I serve Jesus daily. There's things that I don't do because I believe if our manual says not, then you not. There's also things that I'm allowed to do in the freedom that Christ gives. So I want to talk about that a little, little bit this morning. Once y'all get that picture of a Mexican pig and an American pig out of your mind, you can kind of wrap your hand about what we're going to do. But I'm in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1-5 through 5 this morning. And it's a letter that P Peter wrote. And it says, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the province of Pontus, Galatia. Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. I get that dude right. God the Father knew who you were and chose you long ago. And His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His grace and mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, we now live with great expectations. We're going to talk about that. And we have a pr priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you. By his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. And you might say, okay, I got all that, but I didn't get it all. That kind of went over my head. Don't feel bad. We're going to break it down. I want us to listen to the text. It's called as foreigners. You ever felt like a foreigner? Ever feel like you didn't belong? I hope that's Jesus. <laughs> Josh, won't call your name out. Um, if your mom, Miss Rose, is watching, you too, spank him on your phone. But anyway, have you ever felt like a foreigner? Have you ever traveled outside of the United States? Have you ever been in the Mexican restaurant when they're speaking to each other and feel like they're saying that you got a booger hanging out your nose? <laughs> I've been there. In fact, when we go, Tracy's like, please don't say nothing to embarrass me. I'm like, I'm not going to. But could you please talk in American so I can understand what you're saying? Because I feel like you're talking about me. They're like, oh, no, no. And yeah, right. I mean, I trust them. It's not. You, I mean, you know, it's kind of like we went and rode Thursday night with um, uh, the Twisted Riders in Rushville, and we sat down, and I had Sam and a bunch of the guys that Kevin and a bunch of them that were riding with us, and and we uh, we sat down in front of the out in front of the bar that had a fenced in area, and we sat down. And we were talking to some of the people, and I didn't know who they were, and. The subject came up with cross point. Well, you know, if cross point comes up, I mean, everybody's got to talk about it, whether it's bad or good or whatever. So we began talking about it, and this lady, she's like, I've heard of that. They're like, yeah, you ought to come try it out. And I said, yeah, you know, if you'll come, I will sit with you in the audience. And she's like, you do that? I'm like, absolutely. 
I'll sit there and we'll get all these guys that you know. We'll sit down beside you and we'll listen to that preacher. He, and, and one of us spoke up and said, yeah, he talks too much. And I said, yes, he does. He talks way too long. <laughs> She's like, really? And I said, the best thing is, is you don't have to quit nothing that you're doing. And she said, you mean we don't have to quit drinking beer? I'm like, no. She's like, really? I'm like, absolutely. You just come and enjoy it. And she said a few explicit words in the, during her narration of what she was talking about. And she's like, really? Really? And she went to talking and a few other things come. And, and of course, they knew that I wasn't saying who I was because we were talking. And I, I just love to do that. There's a few people in this church who don't know how to not tell that I can't talk about while I'm with them. But these, these ones, was really, their, their lips were sealed. And I looked at her and I said, uh, yeah, you'll have to come. I said, I'm the preacher. She went, you, you're the preacher? <laughs> she's like, I've been talking like this, and you're the preacher? And she looked around, honey, hit the barriers right there. And I'm like, well, we can do that too. <laughs> Living as a poor. As I've thought about this, there's all kinds of stuff that comes up, but even grade school, middle school, anybody remember your middle school time? You remember going to middle school and feeling like you just didn't quite match up? I mean, am I the only one that will stand up and say, I, I was not popular when I was in school? I hung around the, the cowboys, and I drove a car. Yeah, imagine that. Born and raised on a farm and drive a car. <laughs> like my dad did it on purpose. But anyway. We, I mean, I was real popular. We, we would go feed the cows in the mornings. And, you know, you know as boys, it, we probably stepped in it a little more than we should have. And when we'd get to school, that stuff would dry. And the teacher would make you mad. And you'd go, it stink for two days. I mean, you know, that's just the way we work. But I also played in the band. So that was another strike. So I'm, I drive a car. I'm in the band. You know, I, every, we, all, we all went through the, the thing that band kids are nerdy and whatever. So, you know, if you play in the band, you don't have to listen to all that garbage because one of these days when you get old like me, we can still play our instruments, but nobody else can play football and basketball because they can't walk. <laughs> so, hey, we win. So, so we done all that stuff, and I never was a jock, and I didn't really meet in. I, I never got to go to my prom because mom and dad wouldn't allow it. Um, I don't know if Jesus changed or they did when my brother got ready. He went, so I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, but I didn't get to go around there, and I can remember going to our graduation party, and I really wasn't supposed to, but I happened in town about the time the party was, so I, we kind of stopped by. And I can remember the first time that I, the, the star quarterback for the football team, I can remember it to this day, they pulled out a flat flat piece, piece of stainless steel that opened up, and they went, and I first seen my first joint for the first time. I mean, it was all rolled up really neat and in order, and, and it was really cool. But I, you know, I, I was scared to death. Afraid if I smoked it, I'd choke on it or something. And then there I'd be. What happened to you, boy? Well, I tried my first joint today, Dad. I, you know, that would have went over like a lead balloon. So I never did touch that. But but I remember those feelings of feeling like I was. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't meet the bill. Uh, kind of like the same feelings that you feel when you start a biker church in the town of Carnesville when there's 112 regular churches. It's kind of that same feeling. It's like, you're going, what? And I'm, I was excited about it. And they're like, this is, so what are you going to use to preach from? Like, what, what kind of question is that? I'm going to write my own Bible. You get out of the way. We're going to have fun there. Man. Uh, I mean, I know what uh, feeling like a foreigner in your own country feels like, especially in your own town. I mean, it's kind of got good now. I mean, <laughs> the one reason they want us at the dribble over drugs is because anywhere we go, we draw a, a lot of our people come and we have a lot of fun and we act really stupid and, and 
we, you know, stupid attracts stupid. So, I mean, and there we are. <laughs> so, I mean, I, we're, we're kind of popular in Connersville because they dislike, they, they want the biker church there because there's a certain, there's a certain angle that if, if promoters can say, oh, and the biker church is going to be there. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I've had pastors call me up like, hey, we got somebody coming in this week and, and they're preaching for us on Sunday. We was wondering if, if we could bring them over so they could kind of walk through the church. <laughs> for what purpose? Well, what, what are we, a circus show? I mean, we don't have double double headed people. I mean, we got fat, skinny biters. I mean, that's just all we are. <laughs> but they're like, well, they, they don't have none of that around their place. So, so would it be okay? I'm like, knock yourself out. Come over. We'll, I'll tell them about the cuss bucket. You go, oh. <laughs> can you imagine the, the, the drive back to the church? I mean, there, can you believe we got that in this town? It's like having a devil worshiping church. I mean, if, you know, we need to pray. You need to pray. We need to really pray. So when you go home to your church, you can get on your church and you tell them we got to pray for this town of Connorsville because it's got a biker church and they, ooh, uh, they got a bucket with an exhaust pipe on it. So I mean, I know what it is to kind of feel like you don't fit, but but my personality is I'm, I'm just going to have a good time not fitting. So I mean, this morning I want to talk about us being able to live life in the middle of all the people we want to reach. And so, in, in verse 17, he goes on to say, And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. That really just upset me this week because I thought I was God's favorite. I mean, I'm probably the closest perfect person in my mind that God ever created and left to concern. And then he has no favorites. But it goes on to say, he will judge and reward you according to what you do. I had to put the brakes on right there. That right there kind of scared me just a little bit. Because you remember last week, I like to talk about stuff going on and I like to put us right in the middle of it. And, and we talked about God and Jesus being on the right hand and then opening up that book and going, man, I don't know who made you mad on January the 3rd or 90. Five, Lordy, mercy. Were they were they talk to you when you got done saying them words? It, you, you know, all that stuff that now we probably don't do, but and if you paid the bucket today, that doesn't exclude you. You're gonna be up there too. He's gonna he has your name on there too, you know. But we think about that, and it said we're gonna be judged and rewarded according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him. During your time here on as temporary residents. I'm thinking reverent fear. When I grew up, I was scared to death of God. If you got mad at your brother, he was going to break hell wide open the next morning. If if you got mad, you didn't work it out. Because it says, don't let the sun set on your anger. Look it up. It says it probably a little bit different. But it's the same, same principle. So as I was thinking, he called us foreigners and temporary residents. And I don't know what you're going to right, through right now, but the, the, the long and the short of today's sermon is, this ain't forever. It may seem forever. It may seem like it's going to last for, for all the time. <laughs> But I look back what I've done in my life in the last five years. I look at when we started Crosspoint, when, when we thought it was the end of the world because we had all the people, but we didn't have any finances. And I can remember the pressure and the heaviness. It still goes on today, but I can, it helps me to be able to look back and go, you know what? God's got this, and he's going to speak to you guys to help us do what we got to do. But I, I can make it through that. But I can remember the times that I felt like it was over. And I felt like a, there, there's still times in my life where you wake up or you have a great Sunday and a lot of people get saved and then somebody calls you and just lowers the boom on you and it's like, man, Lord, we, are we getting anywhere? Because it feels like everything that goes on in our life is forever and it's never going to change and it's always going to be the same. 
it's like when Tracy and I was talking last night. We had some friends come over, and I went and, and picked up a bike for him, and he's just so excited about his bike. And Tracy's leaf come up on her car, and she's talking about wanting to look at a couple of different things, and you know. And I said, well, we could probably buy a used one. You know, and she, her first thought was, was which she, we've always drove stuff like that, but she said, yeah, but if I buy one, I've got to keep it for the next five years. You, you understand the thought process. Everything that we do, it, it radiates what's going on right now, and we seem to think that whatever happens to us is never going away. I mean, I mean, we come to church and and when we get here, we're excited about thinking about making it to heaven, right? Each one of us. I mean, sitting right here, you can look at the one beside you and probably feel like if you die today, I'm going to see you one day because we're happy, right? You come to church to praise God and you've got all these people standing beside you and you're lifting everybody up. But tomorrow or the next day, if you have somebody die in your life, when we go to the funeral... It's all over with. We're not happy. We're not talking about being better in heaven. And I don't ever go to a, to, a, to a service or perform a funeral. And everybody there be happy because their loved one's gone. They live for Jesus and they left a legacy. But where did the happiness go? So living different. Living as foreigners. Because if somebody passes, the hope that we got in Jesus Christ can be anticipated for. It can be expected. Remember, I prayed so, prayed so not being, not expecting anything out of anybody. There's one thing that we can expect. That if we accept Christ and we live our life pleasing to them, to Him, one day, we will make it. Amen. Some of us are like, well, I man, I hope I live good enough. Why do you hope you live good enough? You know, we talked about this, that sin's not going to enter into heaven. And there's not any perfect people except Christ, and he doesn't live here anymore. So why, why do you hope? If you know, if you know to read your word, hide it in your heart so that you may not sin against God and you know that there's grace, why can't you say, I am headed for the cross and one day I will be in heaven? Because we can expect it. If we do what God says, if we live like God says, to the best of our know-how, and we read His word and we hide it into our heart, there is grace, and we can expect to make it to heaven. That we can hold to. He called us foreigners. I think there's one thing that he wants us to get used to and to remember. Do not get used to this world. You might be sitting here and had the worst week in your life. Everything may have fell apart. But the hope that you can have is that it's not always going to be that way. The world is our world. We're here for something else. I mean, we've all had plans change. We've all had things happen. You may be going through something right now with one of your kids or your husband or your wife that seems like it's going to be the end of the world. I got a 16-year-old that's dating a boy. It's, to me, is the end of the world. I mean, I hate talking about it. I hate thinking about it. It consumes all my time. But it's not the end of the world. Because we've trained her up. And God's going to help her make the right decisions. And I come to the conclusion last week that there's going to be probably a time in her life that she doesn't always make the right choices. And that is what's good. 
So if I'm the fox, it's a hunter. And how does Jesus feel when we make those same choices? Because it's relevant. Because Jesus is our Father, but we never think about what we do to Him when we make bad choices. It lets us that it lets Him down. I mean, it, can you imagine what breaks the heart of our Father when we live life? We're supposed to live in this world, but not the other. We can usually have have. Be okay with short-term stuff. You know, I'm okay. I was okay trading every two years the last three years on a motorcycle. I never put anything on it because I knew it was just temporary. There's a couple of things had to be and the rest of it didn't have to be. And now I've kind of got the thought process that I'm going to run this one on out. And if, if I don't think about it, I'm okay. And y'all may think, you're, you're weird. Well, you are too. Just tell me what you do in life, and we'll talk about it. Because we can make it. I didn't know my bride was in here with me. Um, I, I, we, got, we got crazy stuff that goes on in our head. And if we don't think about this being the, just a little blip in Jesus' big timeline in our life, we're going to be messed up. Because everything in life affects us. Everything in life can decide whether we're happy or sad, most of them. We've got to learn that heaven is the big prize. That heaven is the ultimate healing. See, we've lost people and, 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 and somebody told you, well, they got their ultimate healing. And you're like, if you, if you say that to me one more time, I'm going to poke you in the throat. I've seen it happen. Because most people don't know how to talk about somebody passing away. But if we believe what our manual says, why can't we say, you know what? One day. Because that's what it says. If we live right, one day we will. But we're too afraid to hang our hat on something Jesus said. So do you truly believe do you truly believe what you're saying? Do you truly believe that you can have that relationship with Jesus? Whether you want to call it being saved or relationship, or whatever you want to call it, because I know that some people don't like the word saved and some do. And, and, and I mean, I, I like my relationship to be a relationship because I, I spent many years where I didn't have one with him. I thought I did. I mean, I said the right words. I went with that same thing, and, and, it, and, it, and we just kind of went on with life, but not till I truly accepted him as my father did I have a relationship with Jesus. And what I'm telling you today is you don't have to go through all that crap in your life If you don't want to. Because you can have that relationship. You can have that father relationship with him. He can be the father that maybe you've lost. He can be the husband that you don't have. The Jesus that I serve can be everything I want. Amen. The Jesus that I serve when, when, when my family is 900 miles away and it grieves me because I don't get to be with them. And, and I don't get to be with my mom and dad all the time. And, and I've had to come into grips that one of these days my mom and dad's probably going to pass away. Uh, um, if, 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 if they live just like everybody else in this world which, which we probably know that one day they will I know that I'm probably not going to be there now i got a choice I can either let that just consume all my life I could get upset with you guys because I don't get to go down there at least once a month and all that stuff I could blame it on anybody I could blame it on Tracy because I don't get to see my family it's not anybody's uh, a problem but my own but Jesus is that dad and mom when I'm not around them. Jesus is going to be that comforter if something happens to any one of my family down there and I'm not there. That's going to be the comfort that I have. Jesus can give you that comfort for somebody that you've lost. Because we, we, we can't be worried about living here forever. We, we, 
we can't, we can't, we think about that, but I can't wrap my head around this being temporary. I mean, I mean, there's people that I'm friends with right here in this building that when they pass on, it's going to rip my heart out. And I'm telling you that Jesus is the only one to comfort, but I'm human. I mean, I'm trying to live as if this place doesn't mean anything, but how does this world train you to live? You know, you're making it in life if you've got a brand new truck, you've got a brand new house, you've got your kids driving brand new stuff, you got a bank account that's brand new. You know what? Why not use some of that money so that you can see people be affected? I'm not saying not keep what you want because you got to be good stewards and God's got to, you need to, you need to take care of your house and take care of your family. But the Bible tells us that the first fruits are his anyways. And if we don't use them that way, you're not going to be happy in any part of your life and it's going to control you. Take it from somebody that can, I can leave it or take it. I can have it and I don't. Money doesn't mean a lot to me because I give it away and my wife talks to me all the time about we would have money if we'd stop and give it away. Uh, that's my personality. But how many of you today would like to invest in something that's temporary here in this earth that's going to reach people so that when we get to heaven, I, when, I, when I get to heaven, I want Jesus to come down and go, you know what, son? You did the right thing. Now, he's also going to say, you know, there's a lot of times you embarrass me. You made my name look bad. Because I've, I've done worse than put a bad language on Facebook. I mean, I'll just tell you, I've been worse than Stephen ever was. And I'm the preacher. I don't do that now. But but I had. But you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do my part because I want to see people affected for Jesus. I, I want to see people. I, I want to see people in here that we have prayed for and prayed for and prayed for. But there's a consequence to that. You know, I, I, I've been through a lot in my 45 years. And I have, I've decided that I'm ready to fight straight up with the devil. I'm, I'm willing to go, I'm willing to go sweat to death like yesterday. I'm willing to go be with somebody that, you know, I, I've been on the phone with people that had a mouth of a sailor. And you know what? It doesn't affect me. Because at the end of the day, they still need that hope that Jesus is Lord and this place is temporary. And one of these days we're going to, I don't believe that there's going to be streets of gold in heaven. I believe that he says that because we're not going to understand what pavement's like if it was gold. Would you? I wouldn't. Can you imagine what the mansions are going to be? I can't imagine what the mansions in heaven are going to look like because if if he says streets of gold so that I understand that I, won't, I don't understand, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like when we don't have to worry about eating another hamburger or cheeseburger or anything to live? What's it going to feel like when we can get up after a nice rest with the waves crashing outside of our home that Jesus built us? What's it like when we can jump out of bed and I have to stand there and go, mm. that old back's are killing me. Man, them old knees hurt. What's it going to be like? I can't imagine. You know, what's it going to be like when there's not any more hurting? You know, I, two weeks ago, I think it was, I told you guys about finding out my oldest wasn't mine, oldest daughter. This week I found out my youngest daughter what is mine. So I got one more. But I know, but I know that Tracy give me home. Amen. Amen. It's, it's not it's not honor, it's not honey. It's it's my previous marriage. I spent all week trying to tell my daughter that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who, who dad was. It, it doesn't matter. 
She's still welcome to my house. She's, she's still welcome just like Hunter is. She can still come and stay there. We'll buy her food. We'll, we'll, we'll do anything that we do for Hunter for her. But the devil is trying to tear me down. And I, it ain't going to happen. What I need you guys to understand is that if I can get hope through everything that's going on, you guys can have hope too. Because there's, it's no fun when all that stuff happens. It was no fun when I went through my divorce. It was no, it, it, it was, I was self-medicating. When I woke up the next day, it still was there. That hurts there if you allow it. I can feel myself well up on the inside when I start hearing about it and start thinking about it too much. But, but as fast as it wells up, I let Jesus to smear it back down. Because that's what he does. Yeah. Because those are consequences to the way I was living back then. I, I, not that I had anything to do with that particular part. But obviously, I wasn't making sure that my family was in church. I'm going to stop right there because I started to say something funny probably in time. But <laughs> we all go through stuff in life. But if we can understand that it's not forever, and I don't know when it's going to happen, but one day we're going to wake up. We might even be asleep when it comes. Can you imagine what that alarm clock's going to sound like when that big white horse comes right through there? So don't be doing no drugs. If you do any or you get drunk, don't be doing that. Because who wants to who wants to go, man, I wish that white horse would shut up so I go to sleep. You want to be there? I mean, I want to be awake. I want to know what's going on. I want to be, when he comes through, man, I, I, it's going to be an amazing day. And we got loved ones that need to know that. We got friends in this town and the town surrounded that, that they need to know who Jesus is. But the biggest thing is, is we don't need to tell them. <coughs> we need to show them. I've, I've messed up my whole program here this morning. But if I can find it, I'd like to tell you a couple of things. Because when we think about what the scripture said as holy, I'm going to read verse 2 again. It says, God the Father knew you chose you long ago, and his spirit, his spirit has made you holy. Now, what do you think about when you think about the word holy? Do you, do you think of yourself as holy? <laughs> do you really? I mean, I mean, there, there, there's you know other churches that are holiness and whatever. But have you ever thought of yourself as holy? It says the Spirit made you holy. He set us apart for His His use. Well, when I think of holy myself, I think of perfection. So that kind of kicks me out of being holy myself. Then I think about no flaws. Well, if you know me, I've got flaws. I've got all kinds of them. And so that kind of knocks me out of my human thinking I'm holy. But if I was asked each one of you, if you like the idea of being set apart, you're going to say no. But what goes through your mind when you hear the word set upon? Here's some things that I jotted down that I think of when I think of holy and I think of somebody that has surrendered to Jesus and I think of being set apart as indifferent. Okay? This is just Chris's 101. When I think of somebody that is different or maybe catch you off guard or whatever, I think of somebody that you hear that walks up and thanks a vet for their service when you're in line. I try to, every time I see somebody that's been in the service that has the hat on that says WW2 or Vietnam, I make it a point to walk over and thank them for their service. I seen a young man that was not in the service maybe very long. I think he was a weekend warrior um, in the guards. I walked up to him when we was somewhere in town the other day and I said, thank you for your service. Because I think that if we don't thank people for the very thing that God allowed to happen on earth, we're not showing God's love. And I'm not talking about how you act. I'm talking about setting yourself up 
to be who Jesus needs you to be. Or I think about the, the one who pays for your lunch that's while you're sitting in the drive through I'm sure there's a few in here that's had your lunch bought by somebody in front of you, and it doesn't it feel a little weird? It, it feels like it, it, a human nature is just not that way. I mean, if somebody walks up and says, I, I, I'm going to buy your lunch today, you're like, no, that's okay. I, I mean, I, I know you're having a hard time, but I don't want you to waste that money. But it trips your trigger when you hear somebody say that, doesn't it? What, what's that make you think of? That makes me think of, you know what? That's how God would do if he was here. That's how Jesus would do if he was walking around. Now, I'm not saying go spend all your money on doing all this stuff, but I'm saying, are you ready to make a difference in Connorsville? Because if you got a cross point shirt on, I, I expect you to act. I do expect. Because when we're talking about Jesus, yeah. we're talking about doing things for him. If we can expect him to do right and heaven's real, why can't we expect us to do right because we're, we're, we're running around with his banner on our back? Amen. Or, or maybe a family that bows their head and prays in the middle of the restaurant. How many of you do that every time that you do it in front of anybody, any place? I got 20 hands going up. I mean, why don't you pray for your food? I mean, I know it's a little bit, kind of feels funny. But you know how good it makes me feel when Tracy and Hunter and I are sitting in a, in a, in a restaurant? I even pray in the bar. You know why? Because he don't care that I'm in the bar. I want to thank him for the food because what if you didn't have the money for the food? What if you couldn't afford the food? You know, I've, I've, I've bought people's dinner. I, I run into... Wesley, him and his wife now, um, was in the restaurant one time in Richmond. And I'd just seen him go through, and, and I walked over to the waiter, and I said, you need to send me that boy's check when it comes to do. That's, that's just the right thing to do if you can afford it. I mean, I mean, what happened to all of us? You know, the way that God set the church up, he set the church up, just because we're talking about, this is just a, they, he set the church up so that when we give our 10% or our first fruits, he said 10%, and then it went to 25, and then, then the apostles, apostles give all. I mean, they give all to God. But you know why he set that up? So that everybody that's in this room, we can take care of out of our first fruit. And I know that's a weird way of thinking. I mean, because we've had all these things you know, all the, the big named people that's on TV, they've extorted all that. Got $25 million on the house, and jet, and all that stuff's been going on all week, you know, the last couple of weeks. People's got it all back. God intended us for to take care of each other. But it's, it's weird when we think about it, right? It, it almost sounds like... I don't know. That sounds a little cultish. You ever heard that word? <laughs> yeah, I was with somebody yesterday, and they said, "Yeah, when we first knew about Cross Point, I really thought it was a cult." The, the giving part of your spirit, doing doing things just because that's what Jesus would do. Yesterday. Yesterday, I had a, a, one of the referees walk up to me and say, hey, the woman over there on the other side said that she was giving free hamburger drop. Mm, she probably lied to you. But I said, I'm not sending you away for nothing. What kind of hamburger do you want? I could have said, no, nah, well, wait a minute. I, you know, can't afford that. But why not? I, I'm, I'm really thankful that that lady sent, up, sent, up, sent him over. Because I wouldn't have got to talk to him otherwise. I'm glad he sent him over. Took a big person to come up and say that. I, I'd, I'd have given him two hamburgers if I couldn't get him to take but one. You know, our, our thought process, if this is where we're supposed to be for just a little time, why can't we take what God's given us 
and live life and touch people and, and make friendships and live life like you know Jesus would. Set apart. It's not normal. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do people see you as different? Do people see you as somebody that's set apart and different? I'm not talking about your clothes. I'm not talking about the way you the, the dress, your hair. Do people see that you're set apart? Can they tell? Can they tell by the way you act without any words that you're serving Jesus? I mean, if we put a camera on you like they do for the reality TV shows, could I play that video up here for what you did all week? I mean, could I really? I mean, would you be embarrassed of anything that you've done or said or acted like? When you woke up, you didn't get your coffee and you was cranky? Would, would I be able to put you in front of anybody in Connorsville and then be able to see without words who you really are. Because the Bible says that life is like a vapor. So we're not going to be here forever. It, it comes and it's gone. Do they see that when you're around others you encourage them and you're positive? Are you one of those people that picks up all the negative that they're doing and forgets about saying the positive? Because... I mean, they're already doing good here. Why don't we go ahead and tell them everything they're doing wrong here? Do they see a difference? Do they see a difference in the way that you encourage others or spend your money or take the day off to serve somebody? When's the last time you took a day off and just decided to dedicate it to the kids when we have vacation Bible school? Or maybe just come in and See if there's something to do around here. It's really kind of crazy talking. I mean, each one of us in this room, if this place was not here, it would affect the way we live. I don't know about you guys, but putting myself being the pastor here to the side, could you do life every week without coming in here? I know I couldn't. Could you do life not being able to walk around Connorsville and know that if you call this church and somebody's got somebody dying, that we're going to be there, we're going to feed them, and we'll do the funeral if they ask. Or what about when your teenager's going through struggles? We had a teenager a couple years back that was cut. They called me and said, I'm going to bring her to you. Wait, wait a minute, I'm not, I, 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 I don't know how to take a bath. I said, sure. So the 10 minutes before they got here, I'm like, Lord, you know who I am. You know who, who, who you know what I know. I don't, I don't know how to deal with this. I haven't been to school for this. I haven't even been, had that close to me. When they got here, I sat her down. Still in my mind thinking, you big dummy. Why didn't you send them somewhere else? And we sat down and I got to talking to them. Because I do know how to talk. I mean, I talk about anything. You want to talk, I'm, I'm there. So as I started talking to her, You've had Jesus talk to you, right? Not an audible voice, but I was sitting there and he goes, ask her if she knows me. I'm like, over. Take it, just, just a minute. We aren't there yet. I mean, they come to church all the time. They, they know. And that's when they know. Lord, that's the Come on, that's just, that don't even sound right. That, that's going to offend them. They're going to never come back. Ask them if they know. 
I looked in my eyes and said, do you really know who Jesus is? He looked back at me, just as serious as a heart attack, and said one of the most amazing things that people say. Oh, what do you mean, no? I, I want you to give me some kind of answer like, why would you ask me such a stupid question? But they said, no. And we prayed right there. Right, right in front of God and everybody. Did you know they never done it again? To this day, they had done Guys, I don't know about you, and, and I, I, I apologize because everything I run down here, I, I had, I didn't get to. I guess that's the way the Lord is. But I want you to think about something. We're fixing to pray in just a second. We got seven minutes and fifty seconds, and the Mexican food restaurant ain't gonna close. Neither is Chrome Grill. But I want you to I want you to think about something this morning. I realize we live as foreigners in this world and I live I understand that there are things that that goes on that ruins our day and there's probably somebody here today going through the mud and, and, and you're tired of being made fun of, you're tired of something happening because you you love Jesus. It's not popular. But are you ready to invest in people without saying words? Are you ready to find out where they are in life without shoving Jesus down their throat? You know, I, I've, I've had some pretty good wins in the past month, month and a half of one, 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 two weeks and right here at Cross Point, we had either 15 or 17 saved in two weeks. Uh, if that's not the Lord, I don't know what it is. And that, that's, that's how my Jesus works. But how many of you, how many of you are ready to see Jesus win? Because Jesus uses us. We're the common denominator in the church. He uses us to reach people. Many times he does it without words because we don't know what to say. Why does everybody bow their head and close their eyes? I don't know who's here that doesn't know who Jesus is, and I'm, I'm going to ask because we do every week. But maybe you're sitting here today for the first time, or maybe you're sitting here and don't understand. You, you just now hearing about Jesus. But I want to ask if I raise a hands. Who here would say, Preach, I, I want to know that when Jesus comes, that I'm going to be there with him. I want to ask him into my heart. Just by I raise a hand, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you. Just to raise a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, Lord, I just ask that the two that raise their hands. God, your word says that we have to believe in you to receive. John 3, 16. In Romans, it says that we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Lord, as they come to you this morning and as I pray, and they make it their own prayer, God, that you would just listen to their heart. Lord, I ask that you forgive me of the sins that I've committed. I ask you to come into my life, my heart. Lord, I know that you died. Buried on the third day, you rose again. I ask you to come into my life and help me to live my life.
pleasing to you. God, make you my everything. We believe here at Crosspoint, if you prayed that prayer, that you have now entered into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're on Facebook today and you just prayed that prayer. Please let us know. Because we want to be a part of your life. I'm going to let Kyle and Romina play. Maybe there's something you need to pray about this morning.
Registration is 10 to 12 right here. Uh, there's dinner afterwards. There'll be more flyers in the back if you want to pick them up and uh, pass them out. Um, it's always a great time. Um, just enjoying riding, but also being able to touch kids um, at the end of the year. It's a lot of fun. And we want you to continue to pray. Um, we're still raising money to finish the parking lot. The asphalt, we got to cover the asphalt, restripe it. It's been 40 years. Lovely thing about maintenance, right? Still have trying to put in the gravel. So, you guys, as you um, feel led, um, and also if you do want to use the uh, keypad in the back, uh, Donnie will be back there so he can show you how to use it. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, if I can do it, anybody can. But uh, um, please use that as you need. I'm going to ask if uh, Kevin can come up and pray for us out. Uh, oh, yes, I do have a baby dedication. Thank you very much. Bring Xavier up here. I'm glad I ever said that. I, see, I'm good at that. I'm good at forgetting. Now, he looks a little bitty with you. <laughs> He looked bigger in my office, I think. Don't come on around here. Gotta get the grandparents on both sides. The family's growing one at a time. There's four five more of us out there. They can get up here. Don't be don't be embarrassed. I won't make you talk. Did they have him? 
This is a huge family. I think we got some extended family. You know what? I don't, did, did any of you guys do church before Cross Point? I know it's kind of a crazy question. You see, you see those in kind of and all that. Hey, you guys ought to be proud of that because that's something to say. Amen. Yeah. I'm encouraged. Xavier Jones. What's the two middle names? Say his whole name. Ryan Xavier Ryan Carter Jones. Oh, right. I didn't mess that up. He's a little guy. Sis is a big sister, huh? <laughs> you know, guys, this right here, when you dedicate a, a baby back to the Lord, you know, each one of our kids are on loan. Sometimes we get so wild about making sure they act just a perfect way, and, and if we can't keep them, if we're not right there with them, then something's going to happen. But I believe that God gives us an extended family. And here at Cross Point, we like to... Uh, help the families raise their babies. And if you know anything about our our kids' church, um, it is amazing. We've had so many people walk out and say, you know what, our kids never could say what they learned at, at, at Scooter School in any church. And they could tell me exactly what the teachers taught. And that's, that goes back to Miss Edie and all the Sunday school teachers and just all the stuff and and we got vacation Bible school coming up, and it's going to be amazing. But when you dedicate a baby back to the Lord, what we're saying is, Lord, we, we want to raise them in your life. We want to raise them knowing who you are from the time that they're as big as Xavier until they get grown. And you know, my mom and dad dedicated me when I was a baby. The Bible says that if we train up a child in the way they should go, they'll never depart. And I had my time of... Did I say the wrong thing? That was a cute cry. She was talking to her. I was raised that way. I walked away from the Lord for a time in my life. But the only thing that kept me was that scripture right there. And I want everybody to stand that's going to abide with us and say that we're going to help the whole Jones family raise these two babies just like they were ours. And we're going to be there when they need us. And we're going to protect those babies while they're here. Let's pray. Uh -huh. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, God, we just ask that you wrap up this whole family. God, they got some extended family that's just like family right here in front. They go to a church that our family from the time that they walked in the door. And God, we've been here when there's been hard times. We've been here when there's been laughing times. And God, we've just been here when just sometimes life's been tough. And God, we ask right now, as we lift Xavier up to you, God, that you would help each person in this room to help train up Xavier. That we, you'd help mom and dad every time that there's somewhere to go to learn about Jesus, that they're here. God, we ask that you put a hedge of protection around Xavier. That when he is young, he would know who you are. And God, that he would live for you from now until you come. God, we thank you for this precious, flawless little baby boy. God, we pray that you keep your hand on him. And we pray. Amen. Right in the